Good afternoon and welcome to Code Concepts with Debbie Oler. I'm your host Meg Foley um, and this is the afternoon program for the February 2021 uh, Code Academy. Debbie Oler is going to be presenting Code Concepts, which is a Chapter 1 Code Administration course, just giving you the basics of how we got to where we are in building codes and code administration. Uh, Debbie is our staff engineer and uh, has had a long and storied career in uh, plans examination and professional engineer work. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass this off to Debbie. Take it away. Hey, thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Megan said, I'm the staff engineer with the Board of Building Standards, and this afternoon we're going to discuss some of the basics of code, uh, how how the codes are um, developed, uh, what's behind the scenes with codes that you guys may not realize, and how codes came to be. Um, part of what we're going to do at the beginning of this presentation is just kind of um, show you some video of some pretty horrible fire scenarios and we're going to discuss some uh, catastrophic losses kind of a debbie downer here at the beginning but um, hopefully we'll have some lessons that we learned from these accidents and we're going to discuss all of that and how the codes have come to be as a result of some of these accidents so just sit back and relax and um, if you have some popcorn, you may want to uh, have that with you because we will be watching a few little video clips. Um, so here we go. As soon as the pyrotechnics stopped, the flame had started on the egg crate backing behind the stage and it just went up the ceiling and people stood and watched it. And some people backed off. When I turned around, some people were already trying to leave and others were just sitting there going, yeah, that's great. And I remember that statement because I was like, this is not great. This is time to leave. They thought it was part of the show. They, they did, obviously. There was no way to stop the fire once it started. No one had water. There was the crowd is at least 10 or 12 deep from where I was. How many in the in the uh, in the uh, bar at that time? I couldn't guess, but maybe 150, 200, whatever. Uh, Inside not sure. that bar, 150 people plus the yeah. band and the crew. And at that point, getting out. How did you get out? And 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 were people literally trampled as they got out? At first, there was no panic. Everybody just kind of turned. Most people still just stood there. In the other rooms, the smoke hadn't gotten to them. The flame wasn't that bad. They didn't think anything of it. Well, I guess once we all started turned toward the door and we got bottlenecked into the front door, people just kept pushing and eventually everyone popped out of the door, including myself. That's when I turned back. I went around back. There was no one coming out the back door anymore. I kicked out a side window to try to get people out of there. One guy did crawl out. I went back around the front again, and that's when you saw people stacked on top of each other trying to get out of the front door. And by then, the black smoke was pouring out over their heads, out the side windows on the other side. Um, was... An incredible account tonight from Brian Butler, who was inside the station nightclub when that fire broke out. And it's just chilling to hear him talk about what happened. and. Unbelievable, and of course, again, when we see the video that Brian shot is, well, his, is incredible. His eyewitness testimony is interesting uh, on, on many, many fronts, of course, because it takes us close to ground zero as it takes place, but also because in, combi in combination with many other eyewitness testimony, you get the impression of the many different perspectives and conflicting uh, you know, concepts of what was there. Brian said he thought there were about 150 people there. We spoke to a technician inside uh, who, who reported that he estimated that there were 325. Now, for those of you just tuning in now, 10 after 4 on Friday morning, you're beginning your day with video uh, shot by Brian Butler for Eyewitness News in Providence of uh, the interior of the station uh, nightclub. It's a nightclub in West Warwick where last night, Thursday, at 11 o'clock, the band uh, Great White began their set uh, with a pyrotechnics display, which almost immediately, and you can see it unfolding before your eyes, uh, began to capture 
some foam sound baffling material that clearly was not fire retardant on fire. Um, within a matter of a, of a minute, um, the smoke um, began to engulf the interior and, and the, the number of people inside, uh, you know, tried to get out. They obviously could not exit this particular exit because of the smoke and flames. Uh, we know that many have gotten out and we have over 100 report, or reports of over 100 people who are located now at three area hospitals uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, several have been med flighted up to Boston to New England Medical Center in Worcester, Brigham and Women's, Mass General. Um, but uh, we also know that many are fatal. And I guess, you know, when Brian said he saw people stacked up there, um, you know, they may have been among the, the fatalities. There's a, a quote here from a man who said he was sitting at the bar near the front door when the fire started. It was calm at first. Everyone thought it was part of the act, but it just happened so fast. And that's what you've heard over and over again. And, and Brian's um, video, when he looks at the real time on that, it was around roughly a minute from when he started shooting the opening and the, the pyrotechnic when that fire went screaming across the top of the ceiling of the nightclub and he started backing out. That's how fast this fire moved. And when he ran around to the side and you saw the video, he ran back around to the front. We're talking about two, three minutes tops. And then this building was fully engulfed in flames. The nightclub is gone. We don't know how many people may have died because of what happened there. We know we have dozens and dozens and dozens of casualties and people being treated all over uh, southern New England tonight for, for burns, smoke inhalation, other problems. And as people. Pretty tragic um, event that occurred back in 2003, February of 2003. This occurred again in West Warwick, Rhode Island. And in fact, there were 100 deaths. 230 people were injured and 132 people were uninjured survivors. That just gives you an idea of how many people were packed into this, this nightclub. Um, this building was built in 1946 originally as a restaurant and then it later changed occupancy to this nightclub. It's only about 4,400 square feet. Um, I think what's most striking to probably people who have never seen this video or never seen fire um, footage before is how quickly the space just fills with smoke. You know, you heard the, the gentleman say it was just so fast. Um, one minute to flash over. Within two to five minutes, the entire place was filled with black smoke. So let's look at the floor plan here and see what happened. Um, over to the right, you see the raised platform and you'll see that there are two ignition points that are uh, identified there. That's where the pyrotechnics were um, ignited. You'll see there's an exit here by the stage. This is the front entrance door where everyone went in. And again, that's the most uh, familiar to people. They they went into the club that that way and most of them, many of them tried to leave that way. There was another exit back here behind the main bar and another exit back um, here by the kitchen. It's likely that those exits were not familiar to people. Here's some um, footage of modeling that occurred after the fire shows you the temperatures that were reached um, five feet off of the floor. So you can see it got well over a thousand degrees centigrade. Um, this is 90 seconds after ignition. Pretty, pretty intense. This is a diagram of where the recovered uh, bodies were. Um, so you'll see that it appears that 18 
we're nearing the exit nine. We're we're approaching yeah up there. Um, Thirty one people. It appears we're right in the entrance vestibule. Three over by the bar. Nine back by the kitchen. It appears that some people had gone into the offices and didn't realize that there there were no exits back in that direction. So very, very sad. So what did we learn from this fire? We learned that there were some contributing factors to the life loss, namely approval was not obtained for the indoor pyrotechnics. The acoustic foam on the wall and the ceiling were not fire retardant or resistant. Accounts say that a table was actually blocking the front entrance, which would explain why a lot of bodies were found there. They had that obstacle right in front of them. Occupants were not familiar with their other exit options. There were no sprinklers in this building. They probably wouldn't have been required um, at the time, especially being an existing building and given the size. Um, but fire modeling did prove that had sprinklers been in this nightclub, they likely would have contained the fire, which is even more sad. As a result of this fire, um, there were many lawsuits, as you can imagine. There were several settlements when it was all said and done. The tour group for the Great White Band settled for one million. The owners of the club, 0.8 million. The state of Rhode Island and the city, 10 million. Packaging foam manufacturer settled for 25 million. The TV station that perhaps sponsored this, 30 million. JBL speakers, 0.8 million. Anheuser-Busch, likely another sponsor, 5 million. Home Depot, 5 million. The radio station, 22 million. American foam seller, 6.3 million. So many, many organizations were brought in to be held accountable and pay for this damage. But as you know, we'll never bring back the lives that were lost. This is the fourth deadliest in a US nightclub. Um, ironically, about a week before this fire occurred in Minneapolis at the Fine Line Music Cafe, there was a very similar situation caused by indoor pyrotechnics. The difference there Sprinklers contained the fire and the employees were trained and a smooth exit from that building occurred and no one lost their life. Let's look at some other notable US fires that have occurred over the years, starting back in the early 1900s. Let's start with the Iroquois Theater fire. This occurred in Chicago back in 1903, 602 people lost their lives. This was a theater brand new. It was um, advertised as being a fireproof structure. There were 1600 approximately seats on three different levels. One huge, large main, very ornate entrance and a main open stairway through the lobby. There were several other exits. Um, the problem was the evening of, of this certain event, there were sparks from um, an arc light that actually ignited the curtain. And when this happened, um, Several people were, were trying to get in. It, it very quickly ignited the wood trim on the building. 
There were um, flammable canvas scenery flats, as you can imagine, on most stages during performances. People started leaving the theater, but the problem was it was overcrowded. It was a standing room audience. When people would leave the upper levels to go out onto the fire escape, the doors were open and they blocked people from um, upper levels that were trying to come down. So, and the fire escape was also icy. So it was just a horrible, perfect storm. No sprinklers, no fire alarms, no standpipes, um, emergency lighting, not present, exit signs, not present. So we learn a lot from this accident as well. Let's talk about the Collinwood school fire. This is close to home. This happened in Ohio back in 1908. 172 people lost their lives. Those were children. Two teachers also died. Collinwood is up near Cleveland, in case you aren't aware of where that is. The children, like most kids, did have fire drills that occurred regularly, but unfortunately they were only trained to go out the front door. The day of the fire, the fire occurred very close to that front door. They think that the source of the fire was an overheated furnace or perhaps overheated pipes which ignited a wooden stair. There's also talk that the boiler may have been involved. But in any event, the front door was blocked by fire. There were only two narrow stairs. The rear door was very unfamiliar to most kids and it also opened inward. So it was a horrific um, scene. Children were stacked trying to get out the doors. Let's look at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which occurred in 1911. This happened in New York City on Manhattan. This was a building, a building that was built in 1901, which is today presently part of New York University. There were 146 people that died. The deaths all occurred on the 8th to the 10th floor where this factory was located. The source of the fire was a match or a cigarette which was tossed in a scrap bin. All of the factory workers were on those floors and unfortunately there was no fire alarm system. The doors to the stairwells and the exits were locked to prevent the employees from stealing the products or from sneaking unauthorized breaks. 62 people tried to jump from the windows to get out. The owners were acquitted of manslaughter charges but were found liable in wrongful death suits. Again, the owner was arrested two years later for locking the doors during working hours and they were fined a total of $20. But this event did trigger a labor reform movement in New York City. Let's come a little closer to home again, right in Columbus this time, the Ohio State Penitentiary fire, which occurred in 1930. 322 people died. The source of this fire is still a little um, unknown. Some say that a candle ignited oily rags that were left on the roof. Some were speculating that prisoners did that to create a diversion. But this particular prison was overcrowded, two times the design capacity. It was reported that guards refused to unlock cell doors during the fire and some inmates overtook a guard to let other prisoners out. As you can imagine, that was pretty tragic as well. Another nightclub fire in 1940. 
209 people passed away in this one. This occurred in Natchez, Mississippi. This was a one story building of wood construction. It had about 24 windows in it, but 21 were shuttered or nailed shut. Again, this was overcrowded. Apparently there were 577 paid guests, 150 had passes, 14 band members, five attendants for a total of 746 people in this building. Fire started near the front door. The back door was locked and boarded shut and the doors also were swinging inward. To complicate things further, insecticide treated Spanish moss was used as decoration and hanging from the rafters. I'm sure it was beautiful, but it created a huge hazard. Many of you probably have heard of the Coconut Grove fire. This occurred in 1942 in Boston, Massachusetts. 492 people died. This building was built in 1927. Very overcrowded. After a big rivalry for football game, Boston College versus Holy Cross. The exits were locked. Many of the exits were concealed with curtains. There was a single revolving main exit door. Some of the exits were bricked up to prevent customers from leaving without paying. The source of this fire started when a young soldier unscrewed a light bulb attached to a fake palm tree, which was providing decoration all over the place. He wanted a little privacy for he and his date. A busboy was instructed to go screw, the, screw back in the light bulb. Since he wasn't able to see very well, he lit a match in order to screw in the light bulb and accidentally lit the decorative palm tree. It quickly spread throughout the facility. The power was lost and people couldn't see their way to get out. Draperies, palm tree decorations, bamboo wall coverings, many, many um, combustibles and um, a possible refrigerant leak was also cited as a possible source. Let's look at the Hotel Weinkauf fire in 1946, Atlanta, Georgia. 119 people died, 90 were injured. Again, a building that was touted and advertised as being fireproof. The source of this fire is still unknown, but they have a feeling that it started on the third floor. It was originally um, a guest room, but it was converted to an office. They had temporarily put the furniture, mattresses and so forth in the corridor. And that's where they feel the ignition source began after investigation. Unprotected stairwells, only one stair, wooden corridor finishes and doors. This building was built in 1912, 15 stories, and there was a very long delay in detection of the fire that contributed to the deaths. Again, close to home, right across the Ohio River, down in Kentucky, the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire, 1977. Unfortunately, 165 people died in this fire. 200 were injured. This building was built in 1926 with numerous additions over the years. As you can imagine, it had created a maze of various different event areas, lounges and rooms. Highly flammable carpeting, wooden paneling was present. There were no sprinklers, no fire alarms or smoke detectors. Most of the exits from the event room led to other interior corridors and service spaces. 
That night, John Davidson was scheduled to perform. It was very overcrowded. People were sitting in the ramps and the aisles. The source of the fire was faulty wiring. People were warned actually by one of the employees who came on stage and said to get out of the building. But because the exits were inadequate, it was very confusing, couldn't find their way out. There were many dead end corridors, no firewalls. Many people died. The smoke and the toxic gases just overcame them too quickly. Next, let's look at the MGM Grand Hotel fire. This occurred in Las Vegas in 1980. 85 people died. This is a typical casino hotel that you would see in Las Vegas with the large casino on the first floor. And then above, there were numerous um, 67 hotel floors exactly. During this fire, 80 people died of smoke inhalation. So the majority of people that died um, were all in floors 16 through 26. The fire actually started on the first floor with an electrical uh, wiring issue caused by vibration of a refrigeration unit. Now this building was built in 1970 and at the time it was built, no sprinklers or fire alarm system were required, but it was partially sprinklered. Um, it started in the deli on the first floor. Flames traveled the length of the football field casino in less than 20 seconds. Flames never traveled above floor two. So that tells you it was all a smoke and toxic gas related. The fire dampers were installed improperly. The fire investigation proved that they failed to shut and turn off the HVAC system, which allowed spreading toxic smoke and gas throughout the upper stories of the hotel. The stairwells even filled with smoke and the towers acted just like a chimney. To complicate things even further, stair doors were locking. When people would go into the stair, they were locking from behind. So people, when they entered the stair, couldn't get out. Guests were breaking windows. Several guests, over 300, were rescued by helicopter. And it took over three hours to rescue people. Over 1,300 lawsuits against 118 companies were settled for $223 million. These fires can be very costly, not only in lives, but in, in dollars. Again, let's look close to home. Ohio River Fireworks Store, back in 1996, nine people died. The source of this was um, a cigarette that intentionally lit some fireworks in the small facility. A man um, that was injured in a skateboard accident, so had some cognitive um, issues, was charged with starting the fire. Allegedly, the sprinkler system was turned off. And most of us know the World Trade Center attack of September 11th, 2001, where we lost over 2,600 people. These catastrophic losses, um, you know, they don't seem to ever end. We had one as recent as 2016, the ghost ship warehouse fire incident in Oakland, California, where 36 people lost their lives. This was an, um, a building that had illegally undergone a change of occupancy. It was originally permitted only for industrial purposes. 
and several artists decided that this would be a great place for them to live and work at the same time, not realizing the risk um, in doing so, you know, sleeping in this type of an occupancy. They had cut a hole in the center of the building to create an atrium-like feature. They had stacked pallets to use as stairs. The evening of the fire, they held a, a concert with 80 people in attendance. There were no sprinklers, no fire alarm system, no smoke alarms, lack of emergency exits, and the building was very poorly maintained. Before the fire, there had been reports of electrical problems in this building. This occurred again in 2016. Here we are in 2021, and just last year, the settlements um, were finished. The city of Oakland settled a civil suit for over 33 million. PG&E settled with 32 victims for an undisclosed amount. In September of 2019, the jury deadlocked for conviction of the master tenant. There was actually a mistrial. So four years later, things are still being resolved with this tragedy. Let's look at some other disasters that occur with buildings. We've got hurricanes. Um, September 1900, we had a huge Galveston, Texas hurricane. Approximately eight to 12,000 people died. Destroyed 3,600 homes. They experienced 145 mile per hour winds. Luckily here in Ohio, we don't have to deal with hurricanes, but we do deal with tornadoes. One of the largest tornadoes in the United States was in March of 1925. 695 deaths occurred in Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. The outbreak was the deadliest known with a combined death toll of 747 across the Mississippi River Valley. In 1974, there was a super outbreak. Xenia, Ohio was affected, 32 deaths and destroyed the entire town. Earthquakes occur. Believe it or not, here in Ohio, we have had some earthquakes or tremors. But one of the largest to highlight here is the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. 3,400 deaths destroyed 80% of the city. Flooding. We do have flooding issues here in Ohio. Johnstown, PA is a highlight of a flood. 1889, May 31st. 2,209 people died. And forest fires, we're very fortunate that here in Ohio, we don't typically have to deal with this. But in California, you've seen it in the news. Last year, there were over 900, 9,000, I'm sorry, 9,639 fires had burned 4,397,000 acre, 97, acres. The fires destroyed over 10,000 buildings, cost over 12 billion in damages, including 10 billion in property damage and 2 billion in fire suppression costs. Let's look at a different type of disaster. This is a failure, a structural failure that occurred in Kansas City. This was at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in 1981, 114 people died and 216 were injured. The cause of this tragedy was a structural overload resulting from design flaws. 
two walkways which were suspended from the ceiling, as you can see here, collapsed in a multi-story atrium, one on top of another. Unfortunately, the collapse occurred while a dance was occurring. The hotel opened in 1980, so this was just a short time after the hotel opened. Investigation revealed changes to the original design of the walkway, steel hanger rods, and the, the beams were overloaded. Bolts were placed directly through welded beam joints. Over 300 lawsuits and $140 million was awarded to victims and their families. And now, unfortunately, it seems to be more and more that we have school shootings. Virginia Tech, 2007, 33 people lost. Columbine High School, Littleton, Colorado, 15 people lost. Sandy Hook Elementary, Newtown, Connecticut, 28 children. Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, just a few years ago, we lost 17. Santa Fe High School, Santa Fe, Texas, we lost 10. Red Lake High School in Red Lake, Minnesota, we lost 10. Now let's talk about some plumbing issues, Legionnaire's disease, outbreaks in the United States. The first one was noted in Philadelphia. That's where it got its name because it was uh, discovered during an American Legion convention. 34 people died. In New Jersey, we had another outbreak. Two people died. Miami Valley Hospital here in Ohio, 2011. Five people died. On and on. Even, <coughs> excuse me, even here in Columbus, Ohio, as recently as two years ago, we had an outbreak. Two people died. So when all of these tragedies occur, the government usually steps in and um, change is demanded. These unacceptable losses, um, people want someone to do something and the government is where they turn. They have an expectation that the government's gonna write rules to protect the public. So that's where we come in. As building and fire officials, um, we are charged with protecting the public through the rules that the government writes. Now, after the Iroquois Theater and the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, um, there were committees that were established at the national level. Back in 1913, there was a committee that established the, um, the now known Life Safety Code. How does the government protect the public? We identify hazards, we evaluate the risks, and we provide strategies to reduce and minimize risks. A hazard is something that can cause harm. A risk is the chance, whether it be high or low, that that hazard will actually cause harm. So when we when we have tragedies like we just discussed, oftentimes the legislature will have a knee jerk reaction and they'll, you know, they'll write a law to prohibit something or to require something. Ideally, we would like to investigate, use scientific data and lessons learned from these catastrophes to make informed decisions. But oftentimes when we have inadequate enforcement or we have excessive enforcement or a catastrophic loss, as we've discussed, laws will change. In Ohio, we used to have the legislators who wrote the building code. This happened in 1911, the first Ohio building code, and it was established in the law until 1956. That's a long time to have a building code that's in Ohio law. This particular 
building code we actually have in our library. And we've noticed that it was incomplete. Um, it was inadequate. And given that it was in the law, it was very difficult to update. So finally, after hearing numerous complaints, the legislature changed the law and gave the Board of Building and Standards the authority to adopt the building codes as administrative rule. That's what we do today. We adopt the building, plumbing, and mechanical, boiler, elevator rules as part of the Ohio Administrative Code. Those are known as administrative rules. Now, some of these laws that the legislature creates are also um, limitations for our board when we adopt the rules. So one of the limitations that we have to make sure that our rules um, are consistent with is the limitation of retroactive application of new building code rules on existing buildings. So many of the tragedies that we just discussed or that you just listened to may not have been able to be prevented. Um, for example, we don't have the ability today to retroactively require sprinkler systems in existing buildings. Now, fire officials have more of an ability to do so than what building officials do. But generally speaking, existing buildings are allowed to remain as is. Another uh, limitation given to the board in writing our rules, um, the legislature has exempted certain buildings that are used for agricultural purposes. So there are no building codes that apply if the building qualifies for agricultural purposes. And additionally, the legislature stepped in back in 1981 and required all high rise apartment buildings to be retrofitted with smoke detection systems. So even though the legislature has given the Board of Building Standards the authority to adopt rules, we do um, have overarching um, directives, I guess, from the legislature that limits what we can uh, write rules for. So we have to be very cognizant of that and our rules cannot conflict with the law. One of the good things um, that the legislature did when they gave the Board of Building Standards the right to adopt rules is that it, it allows um, our building code to be to be developed with expertise um, from the members of our board. We have a 15 member board and um, much of the construction industry is represented by membership on that board. For example, we have a fire official on the board. We have engineers, architects, um, specialty materials, builders, uh, energy conservation specialists, attorneys, mayors. So with that expertise, we feel that we develop a much uh, better code than what the legislature would be able to. Additionally, being able to adopt a building code in administrative rule allows for our rules to be adopted and amended much more easily than than does um, trying to change the law. Now, the purpose of Ohio's building codes um, is laid out in the revised code section 3781.11. The non-residential building code or the commercial building code, as we usually call it, is intended to be a uniform minimum code. The residential code, on the other hand, is intended to be a uniform code. Now, the residential code is a little bit different than the commercial code. It has more prescriptive requirements than does the commercial code. The commercial code, while it does have several prescriptive requirements, also has performance options. 
and this allows for more design flexibility. The building codes in Ohio are supposed to permit materials and methods that may reduce costs. The codes are also supposed to encourage standardization of methods and materials without preference to any particular type or class of material. And finally, the building codes are intended to maintain an acceptable risk threshold. Now we have to understand that a certain level of loss is accepted. Um, it's, it's accepted as tolerable simply because communities have limited resources. I mean, we could build buildings of all concrete um, and, you know, not allow any sort of combustible materials and uh, no combustible pipes and so forth, and that would certainly reduce our risk of fire. But number one, it would be very expensive to build in that way. And it doesn't provide much design flexibility. So let's talk about some of the building hazards that exist. Of course, we have the hazard of fire. We have the hazard of explosions, natural disasters, slips, trips, and falls. This actually is, um, according to the CDC, fall death rates in the US increased over 300%. And this is one of the leading causes of workers' compensation claims. So falls are a huge issue. And that's one of the reasons that our building codes uh, focus so much on egress. We also have provisions for structural failures. We, ad we do address a uh, Legionnaire's disease in our plumbing codes. Carbon monoxide poisoning is an issue that we address, electrical shocks, air quality hazards, the list goes on. This list is not complete and it's not in any particular order. But just so that you're aware, these are some of the hazards that our building codes try to address. And school shootings, believe it or not. You wonder what does a building code have to do with school shootings? Well, ironically, our building codes have been developed with fire safety in mind. For years and years, especially since all of these fires that we just discussed, the school fires where we lost so many children, we have learned very well how to protect buildings since that time. We do fire drills and a lot of um, schools are now sprinklered in order to get public funding. So they're relatively very safe structures, but introduce a school shooting and now you've got competing goals. We've designed buildings to enable people to get out quickly in the, in the event of a fire or another type of emergency. And the doors always have to be um, unlocked and able to be operated when occupants are inside of a building. But now we introduce school shootings and, and we our, our hesitancy or our, um, our reaction is to lock people into the building so that they can no longer get out. And this creates a competing problem for the occupants. You know, if there were to be a fire during a shooting and we've locked them in with special locking devices, then they may not be able to get out because of the fire. So. We have to strike a balance when we're working through our building codes. And this happens to be one of the issues that the legislature stepped in and required that the board's rules allow for these um, TDLDs, temporary door locking devices. So we're constantly trying to balance hazards and risks in our building code in response to these horrific uh, tragedies that have occurred. 
since 1979, the board has actually um, adopted model building codes. And one of the reasons that we do this is to um, be consistent with what other states in the country are doing. It allows builders to work across state borders without having to learn new building codes or even having to buy new building codes. So these model codes um, have very similar objectives to what our Ohio uh, legislature has given us as, as a directive. The model codes um, are intended to establish minimum requirements that provide a reasonable level of safety, health, and general welfare through structural strength, means of egress, stability, sanitation, light, ventilation, energy conservation, and to provide a reasonable level of life safety and property protection from the hazards of fire, explosion, dangerous conditions, and to provide a reasonable level of safety to firefighters and emergency responders during emergency operations. So it's quite a mouthful, but the model code objectives seem to be very consistent with um, the building hazards that we've just identified. Let's talk a little bit about all of the different model code types that exist. So right now, um, we are using a model code system that is developed by the International Code Council, or sometimes called the Code Council or ICC. They have a series or a family of codes, um, not all of which our board adopts. For example, a zoning code. ICC publishes a zoning code, but zoning um, is not a state issue, it's a local issue. So we have not adopted this international zoning code published by ICC. But we do adopt their building, mechanical, plumbing, fuel gas. Portions of the existing building code we've adopted into our chapter 34. We do adopt the energy conservation code published by ICC. And the state fire marshal also adopts the fire prevention code so that our building code and the state fire code are coordinated and work well together. ICC also publishes a property maintenance code, and this is available for local jurisdictions to adopt to address maintenance issues. How do these ICC codes stay current? Well, there is a national system that continuously evaluates code provisions. These code provisions account for current research and data and statistics are incorporated in the development of the codes. If any of you have had the opportunity to attend an ICC code hearing, you get to see this process playing out. This is a consensus um, code development process and it's a series of meetings that are held across the country and the meetings are open to anyone who has an interest in developing the codes. Um, we have researchers that attend and propose code changes. We have just, you know, regular citizens like you or I that attend and propose code changes. In fact, I submitted my first code change proposal through the ICC process last month. So it's open to anyone. Um, there's a committee uh, that that hears and looks at all of these code change proposals and all of the data and statistics that's presented, and they make an initial determination of whether a code change proposal should be approved or denied, or possibly even modified. And then finally, um, public comments are heard, and the governmental members of ICC get to make the final determination. It's a very um, long process <laughs> and we've sat in code hearings for hours and hours. Our staff is all uh, actively involved. Some of our staff are actually on the committees. I was actually on the code 
uh, development committee for the International Mechanical Code for four years. Um, so it's something that uh, we support and we're very involved in. Um, and we encourage you guys to get involved as well. Now, not only do we have this model code development process, but we also have a BBS petition process. So when Ohio adopts these model codes, we do make what we call Ohioizations, or we make Ohio changes to, to the model code before we officially adopt it into administrative rule. And anyone, any one of you, um, if you're having issues with certain code language or a certain code provision and you would like to suggest a change, we have a BBS petition process um, and it's open to, to all of you. If you're ever interested in this, we have the petition form on our website. And if you need help, just um, ask any of our staff and we'll be happy to help you. So these, getting back to these national codes um, and the system, the codes um, are updated every three years. And this allows for recognition of new materials, new methods of construction, um, it accounts for maybe some fire modeling that may have occurred. Um, it addresses new society objectives. Uh, and as part of the co proposed code change proposals, proponents are required to provide a cost impact um, of the code change. And so this enables our board staff to evaluate what effect it will have if we were to adopt this new code change proposals. And remember, we're required to balance uh, cost along with all of these um, risk thresholds and uh, making new materials uh, available for use. So we have quite a task, uh, quite a task ahead of us um, when we adopt our next building code. So also part of this national system is the development of consensus standards. Now, if you look in chapters 35 of the building code, chapter 15 of the plumbing and mechanical codes, you'll see an entire chapter just filled with hundreds of standards that are referenced out of the building codes. This is all um, part of this national system to keep things up to date to recognize new materials and methods of construction. And our building codes stay relatively up to date um, by updating these reference standards that are used in the building codes. Now capabilities of testing labs, certification and listing evaluation bodies. This is all part of this national system in section um, chapter one, section 114 of our building code, we actually lay out this um, recognition process that the board has for recognizing the testing labs. And this is, this is a way for us to be assured that the products are being used in the buildings, are safe, they've been tested, and that the laboratories and listing bodies that are doing all of this testing and evaluation are actually qualified and independent. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the science behind the codes. No matter what the hazard is, whether it be fire or whether it be falls or structural issues, there's a scientific research and, and data that will help us create codes that will promote a reasonable level of safety. So let's just focus on fire for the rest of the day because that's what much of the building code is devoted to, fire safety. But keep in mind that this, um, this process that I'm laying out or what happens for fire safety also happens for the other hazards that are addressed in the building codes. So now we're going to watch a little uh, video um, that was produced by the National Institute of Standards and Technology called NIST. So you can sit back and learn a little bit about what the National Fire Research Laboratory is up to.
built to house an inferno. That's how scientists from the National Institute of Standards and Technology describe the newly expanded National Fire Research Laboratory. This description is not an exaggeration. The laboratory is one of the world's largest indoor fire testing facilities, capable of burning huge structures up to two stories tall. Researchers will be able to recreate how entire office buildings, hospitals, and even bridges react to fire. The facility is unique in its ability to combine controlled large-scale fires with state-of-the-art structural testing and advanced measurement, all while keeping staff safe and preventing soot and other noxious emissions from escaping into the atmosphere. So the National Fire Research Laboratory allows us to study fires up to 20 megawatts in size. To put that in perspective, a small fire such as a trash can fire might be 50 kilowatts in size. A vehicle that's burning, a fully developed car fire, could be on the order of, of 5 megawatts. The fire that you see behind you here today is 400 kilowatts in size, or 0.4 megawatts. That's uh, about 50 times less than the total capacity of the facility that we have now. Throughout the world, there's a lot of large structural testing laboratories and there's several large fire labs, but nowhere do we combine both structures and fire in the way that we do here. So in this building, we can actually take a structure and burn it all the way to the point of collapse. And we can do this in a controlled way. And we bring to bear decades of understanding of fire science, as well as high fidelity metrology. The data gathered by the scientists and engineers performing research at the facility will greatly improve fire protection standards and spur innovation in building materials and design. With the addition of the structural uh, side of the building, now we are working with the structural engineer. And what we have found is that we have developed a really good synergy and we're all learning from each other. The fire guys are learning about structural engineering and the structural engineers are learning about fire research. In the not so distant future, the results of the collaboration and innovation happening in this lab will help professionals to build fire resistance into structures from the very beginning during design and planning, which means safer buildings for everyone. So that was a pretty cool video, wasn't it? You get to see some fire testing in action. Let's talk a little bit about fire dynamics. We're not gonna go into um, this into too much depth. I just wanted to kind of tie it all together for you when we watched the video of the um, the station nightclub fire. We, we noted how quickly the space filled with smoke and toxic gases. When fire scientists or fire protection engineers study fire, they actually um, have learned how the smoke moves in certain um, situations, and it moves differently in enclosed spaces versus ventilated spaces. And it moves differently in atriums than it does in enclosed spaces. So. We've learned a lot over the years, and this is still um, a science, I guess, in its infancy. We're learning a lot. Things have changed quite a bit over the years. Um, but this is a typical uh, fire plume. So imagine that the fire is um, was started right there in the center of this room, and you can see how the smoke kind of immediately goes straight up, and it kind of flattens out at the top of the ceiling. We call that the ceiling jet. And once the room is filled with smoke at the ceiling level, then that smoke quickly starts dropping, dropping, dropping. And it entrains a bunch of air with it. And it just creates this huge hot gas layer full of toxic uh, smoke and gases. And it ignites all of the other elements in that room, all of the uh, furniture, all of the pictures, anything gets heated up to its ignition point and just uh, the room is just completely engulfed. And then we have flashover and it's just, um, it happens so quickly. 
and most people don't realize how quickly all of this happens. So I just wanted to kind of show you a typical uh, compartment fire, but this, as I mentioned, it changes a lot depending on whether there are doors or windows open or whether there is an HVAC system providing ventilation to the space. Um, so it's very complex and there are a lot of variables that go into modeling fires, but in case you weren't aware, um, there are fire protection engineering firms that have computer uh, models that they can simulate fires. And we just saw that NIST, um, the, the NIST video, they have a huge uh, new piece of equipment called a cone calorimeter, which is enable them, enabling them to perform all kinds of fire tests and obtain more data on heat release rates of products. So they will continually be burning things and providing data to the fire scientists so that they can model fires um, while they're designing buildings and they can kind of come up with a worst case scenario. Um, they can figure out if they, uh, if a fire starts in a certain location, knowing the fuel load that is associated with that, um, with that fire, they can figure out how quickly the smoke level will drop. And given that variable or equation, then they can figure out how long people have actually to get out of the building safely. So as you can imagine, we want to keep this. I'm going to see if I can use this little pointer here. As the fire grows, this hot gas layer will drop, 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 drop. But ideally what we're wanting to do is to keep this space clear and free so that people can walk out of the building to the exits safely. That's ultimately the goal is to uh, make sure that people can see, maintain visibility, maintain tenability in that space so that people can safely get out of the building. So let's look at um, evacuation and human behavior in fire on kind of a fire timeline here. So you'll see over here on the left, this is the point of ignition. Now this is a timeline that we're talking about. So the next logical thing that would happen would be you get some sort of a cue or maybe the fire alarm system will go off and alert you that there's a potential problem. You may not see the flame or you may see the flame, but at this point, you're going to be seeking more information. What should I do? Should I get out of here? What's going on? What does that mean? Um, these are all normal reactions to people uh, from people in an emergency. Sometimes you may, um, if you're in a group, you may talk with other people and decide, huh, are we going to leave? What are we going to do? Um, so there's lots of things that happen as humans, things that we do. And then at some point we're going to make a decision. And we're going to decide uh, what we're going to do, what we're going to take with us, um, if anything, and how we're going to get out of this building. All of this time, as you can imagine, is creating a delay period for us. Um, and then eventually you're just going to move. This whole process right here is called the pre-evacuation period. Once you start moving, then this is called the movement period. And this is when you are actually engaged in walking out or saving yourself, getting out of the building to safety. Now we, we put this into an, an equation form where we have the time to notification plus the reaction time plus the pre-activity action time plus the travel time is the total evacuation time. And this is how um, fire protection engineers kind of um, determine and design buildings. 
you know, they model things. There are lots of egress models that are out there available. Now, this is a very high level um, evacuation <laughs> equation. It's not this simple. This is oversimplified and there are a lot, a lot of factors that go into um, to these equations more so than what you see here, but we just kind of wanted to simplify and show you how uh, how this all works together. So let's look at delay times. This is some data that um, investigators have uh, discovered or research, and this data is laid out here by event. Typically, this type of data is obtained by sending out a questionnaire or surveying survivors of a fire after the event. And sometimes they collect uh, data by running videos during fire drills. That's how they can um, develop data that they can use in these fire models and egress models. So this particular uh, data set um, is from an old version, I think, that was part of the SFPE Handbook of Fire Protection Engineering. I have a newer version, which um, the tables are slightly different. But the, the thing that I want to point out to you here is, remember we had talked about the MGM Grand Fire and how there was no alarm notification. Um, so let's let's compare some of these delay times. Um, the median delay time was about 60 minutes and the maximum delay time was 290 minutes. Remember there were about three to five hours of helicopter rescues that were reported. This was the Las Vegas fire, if you recall. So then let's just compare a typical office, high rise office building delay time. And you'll see that the maximum was 2.3 minutes. This was an unannounced fire drill. So these people um, are trained and they've got staff helping them to get out like a fire warden. Um, they have voice instruction. So you see that people uh, respond much quicker when they have clear direction. When people are guiding them, telling them what to do. So there's a lesson learned um, that it's always good to to have fire drills and it's it's better even to have voice instruction rather than just alarm uh, signals. So according to the Society of Fire Protection Engineer Guide to Human Behavior, when engineers are modeling occupant behavior, most of the input that's needed for, for these models would be the delay time for people to begin evacuation. And then you also need um, travel and walking speeds. Here's some typical data that the engineers might use in these models for travel or walking speeds. You'll notice that um, the speeds differ um, when you're on stairs, ramps, escalators, horizontal surfaces. And again, if um, there are some mobility issues like people using a cane or a walker or a wheelchair, that affects their travel walking speeds as well. What we see here under normal conditions is that the average person walks about one meter per second or about 60 meters per minute. Or if you prefer to compare it to the speed of a car, it's about 2.24 miles per hour. This is assuming that um, density is not a factor. And again, depending on a person's abilities, those walking speeds will change. 
But in addition to delay times and walking speeds, when fire engineers are modeling egress, um, they need available route options. That's typically found on construction documents. And they need to know how many paths to choose from. And again, people will react differently depending on their familiarity with the building, their proximity to the exits, whether or not they see an exit sign, what other people are doing has a huge effect, and what the local environmental conditions are. So, you know, if that smoke is very close to them, or if the temperature starts increasing, or if they actually see the fire, their paths may be limited. So when we have um, people moving, we also address a travel flow variable. And this is this depends upon how crowded the space is and whether or not the people are trained. So we've got some data here that engineers might use in their egress models. The average walking speed again, 250 feet per minute Shuffling speed would be less than 145 feet per minute. Average flow rate depends um, on whether you're walking on a level passage or downstairs or upward travel. Walking speeds will, will vary. Um, here we've got a density um, diagram and this is showing us people per square foot and speed. So the more people that are in this space, the slower egress will be. So there are lots of um, variables that go into doing an analysis. Um, let's talk about some of the other data that scientists rely upon when, when looking at uh, fire risks and fire safety in buildings. And this is actually a fire test that is prescribed in our building code. And this is the test, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the fire test that is used to determine fire resistance rating of assemblies. And it can be used for walls, for floors, for um, columns, for beams. But um, sometimes you'll notice in the building code that there is a two hour fire resistance rating required between dwelling units, for example, or a one hour fire separation. You may wonder how those um, are determined. And that's done through this ASTM E119 test. This test is used to evaluate the duration for which building construction materials and assemblies can either contain a fire, retain structural integrity, or both. So they subject this assembly, whether it be a floor or a wall, to a certain uh, time temperature curve of fire. They usually use these big gas burners and then after it's been subjected to all of this heat, then they subject it to a hose stream test and they want to see if it can maintain its integrity during that um, hose stream test after being heated. And then it passes and they assign a certain fire resistance rating to that particular assembly that's been tested. And then what happens is that a certification body, such as gypsum board, which we've illustrated here, or it could be underwriters laboratory, or it could be factory mutual, any of these testing and listing certification bodies um, can create a, a listed, um, a listing manual that 
identifies all of the different assemblies that have been tested. Usually um, a design number is assigned to the tested um, assembly, such as what you see here. You know, this is actually what was tested and it tells you exactly how it was constructed. And then it performs the fire test and it determines that this particular tested assembly can withstand a, a one hour fire. So when the building code says you need a one hour rating on this particular assembly, a designer may choose this particular uh, design and incorporate it into his or her building design. And so what's really important as plans examiners is that you verify um, that this particular tested assembly as it's described is actually how it's detailed on the construction documents. And it's really important for you inspectors to verify that as well, because if they vary from this in any way, we really truly don't know how it's going to perform. That's why it's so important that when you have a rated assembly incorporated into a design that it be constructed um, exactly how it was listed and determined to perform during fire testing. So you should be seeing um, designs such as this um, when you're doing plan review and inspections. Now here's another test that is prescribed in our building code. This is the Steiner tunnel test. In other words, known as ASTM E84. This is the test method for surface burning characteristics of building materials. This is the test apparatus that determines flame spread index and smoke developed index. You'll often see requirements um, uh, one example pops to mind is in the mechanical code where we have a requirement spelled out for a certain flame spread and smoke developed index in order to be included in a plenum. You know, so the material that's present in a plenum, whether it be pipes or conduits or uh, cables, um, it would have to meet a certain flame spread and smoke developed index. And those products are tested using this ASTM E84 method. Another test method that we prescribe in our code is the radiant flux test. And you'll find in chapter eight of our building code, which is the interior finish um, chapter, we uh, say that products used um, have to be tested in accordance with this NFPA 253 standard. This is the standard test method for critical radiant flux of floor covering systems using a radiant heat energy source. And this is the common test that's used for carpeting and other horizontally mounted floor covering systems. So if they can pass the test that's prescribed here in this standard, then the product can be used. Now let's flash back a little bit and remember the purposes of the codes that we talked about earlier. So we are attempting to permit materials and methods that may reduce costs and we're also encouraging standardization of methods and materials without preference to any particular type or class of material. And again, maintaining acceptable risk thresholds. How do we put this all together? So when we're permitting materials and methods that reduce cost and encouraging standardization, as I mentioned earlier, we've laid out um, a section in our building code, section 114, and we have an entire rule dedicated to describing this national process that testing labs have to follow in order to get recognized by the board. If you're interested, that rule is 4101 colon 7-6-01. Um, but we recognize testing labs. We have a staff member, Rob Johnson, on our staff that actually evaluates testing lab applications to make sure that they have been accredited and that they are 
um, independent labs um, that are performing these tests that we prescribe in the code. And we published that list on our website in case you were wondering. Then these test labs assign assembly design numbers for their rated assemblies. And then they publish them in their listing books or on their website. And then these product manufacturers that make uh, any kind of product that you can think of, furnaces, um, oh, I can't even think of any others right now, dampers, um, all of the products that we prescribe in the code have to meet certain uh, standards that are laid out in our building code. And then after uh, they have been manufactured, they have a label that's put on the product and that label is how um, inspectors can verify that that particular product is actually what was specified. So we have this whole process that's laid out. The codes require use of listed and labeled products. The design professionals are obligated to specify listed and labeled products. The plans examiners are supposed to verify that the listed and labeled products are being used and that they're being used consistently with the listing. And then finally, the inspectors can verify by looking at that label that the correct um, and approved product has been installed. Let's look again at uh, one of the other purposes, maintaining acceptable risk thresholds. So there's constantly ongoing research and testing happening, as you just witnessed in that NIST video. Um, these tests and all of the research that's being performed behind the scenes allows us to understand the dynamics of fire growth. It allows us to understand how the smoke and the toxic gases move within buildings and all the variables associated with that, such as ventilation. It also allows us to understand how long building materials will withstand fire. It allows us to predict how significant a fire might be given a known commodity in a building. And it provides us data that enables us to understand human behavior in a fire. So when we talk about maintaining acceptable risk, and again, risk is the chance that any hazard, in this case fire, will actually cause harm. All of these things allow us to better manage the risk. All of this data, all of these statistics that I've shared with you, you don't have to memorize them or anything. It's just kind of to show you behind the scenes some of the stuff that's happening by researchers and scientists to help us developing better codes. Now let's talk about what we mean by this risk. Here are some of the factors that influence human behavior and risk whether an occupant is sleeping. As you can imagine, when you're sleeping, it takes a long time for you to um, become awake and alert um, before you can even begin the thought process of getting out of the building. We talked about this a little bit earlier, whether you're an occupant that is alone or in a group will also affect your behavior in a fire. Whether occupants are familiar with the building. Remember when we talked about the station nightclub, there, there were people that didn't realize there were other exits available to them. Most people out of habit and familiarity will try to exit from the same door that they entered the building. And that's where everybody got bottlenecked and unfortunately passed away. Whether occupants have sensory impairments now, I would imagine that a lot of the um, occupants at the nightclub were probably a bit impaired um, by drinking alcohol, but there are other types of sensory impairments as well. Um, people could be blind or have hearing deficit. Um, when the space is really loud, such as occurs in a nightclub, um, that affects your ability to to hear and um, respond in an emergency situations. And then on top of that, when occupants have physical or cognitive limitations, um, that will affect 
and influence the risk. Number of building exits that are available and travel distance to those exits affects how people um, can get in and out quickly and that will affect the risk. The number of occupants in the building, as we discussed earlier, as the density goes up, the travel speed goes down, and that will affect the ability to get to safety. Whether or not fire protection systems are in the building will have a huge influence on the risk. If you know that the building has a complete sprinkler system in it, um, and you've been alerted through a fire alarm system, you can feel pretty pretty safe that the risk has been reduced significantly should a fire occur, um, but you should always still get out. Whether emergency lighting and signage is in the building, that will help you to navigate uh, your way out safely. Whether exposed to smoke, toxic gas, or elevated temperatures, and whether there are any other potential hazards that may be um, in the building that you may have to uh, navigate around or through. Um, so these are some factors. They're not all of the factors, but these are some factors that influence our behavior and the risk. As risk factors increase, additional building protection should be added to offset that increased risk. So for example, if, if the space is filling with smoke and toxic gases and the temperature rise, is rising, this reduces our visibility and it reduces the time that we have to reach safety. So they're all very interrelated. Increasing our travel distance will increase the time necessary to reach safety. And obviously any delays in being notified or cued to the fire situation will increase the time that we have to get to safety. So obviously the best uh, situation is when we have very early notification that there is a situation and we immediately without delay respond and get out. Now, some of the strategies used to manage fire risk are kind of laid out in our building code as well. And it's a big, um, it's a balancing situation as we discussed earlier. We're trying to balance all of these risks with the by offsetting these risks by adding additional safety equipment such as fire protection systems um, smoke removal systems and so forth but there is a strategy that's kind of built into the building code where depending on the occupancy of the building we determine whether it's safest to get people out of the building and we call that the evacuation strategy and that could be where we immediately want to get everyone out of the building, or we could decide that it's best to um, perhaps just maybe uh, evacuate the fire floor and the floor above or below the fire floor. That's called a zone evacuation. Or we may even do a staged evacuation. So these are, um, these are decisions that are made and implemented into a fire safety plan. Um, when we, let me back up a little bit here. When we decide that evacuation is the strategy that we're gonna use to get people out of this building in an emergency, means of egress becomes especially important. And there's a whole chapter dedicated to designing means of egress and the concepts of means of egress um, because we wanna make sure that that is a safe way to get people out of the building. It's protected by having fire resistance ratings, uh, doors, um, stairs have to be designed in a certain way to avoid tripping hazards. They have to be a certain width to accommodate all of the people and the density that may be in that space. Um, so egress becomes very, very important if we have designed this building uh, for evacuation. 
Another strategy that's used um, is what's called the defend in place strategy. Now this is incorporated. Um, one example I can think or a couple examples are the institutional occupancies or hospitals, um, prisons, where we we know that the people may not be able to um, evacuate the building because they may be sedated, they may be in surgery, they may be imprisoned behind bars. So we we um, we address those kind of occupancies in a different manner than in, if we were planning to evacuate people from a building. So when we um, when we have a defend in place strategy, then it's really important that we offset the risks of keeping people in the building by building safety features into the building, such as fire resistance rated assemblies, walls, floors, and incorporating fire protection systems into the building so that the people are safe and um, they can still breathe if a fire should occur in that building um, while they are staying in place, protecting in place or defending in place. Another strategy used is relocation. So these are all again incorporated into the fire safety plan and also incorporated into the building codes kind of behind the scenes. Some of the tools that we use to manage the risks of a fire would be fire prevention. This is first and foremost. I put this first because ideally we would like to prevent a fire from ever happening. And we can do this through education. We can do this with fire safety and evacuation plans. And the fire code actually does require, um, I think it's in section 404, does require fire safety and evacuation plans for different occupancies depending on the occupant load. Uh, we also um, have training and drills and maintenance of the systems and the operational um, happenings that are occurring in the building. So most of these fire prevention issues are addressed in the fire code. And in Ohio, the state uh, fire code, the Ohio Fire Marshal's Office um, adopts the model International Fire Code and we work with that office uh, to coordinate with our building codes. But let's assume that um, a fire does happen and uh, one of the tools in our building code, as we just discussed, uh, to, help up, to help offset some of the risk is to design the egress system in compliance with the code. We also have fire protection systems that are required depending on uh, the building occupancy and the size and the height of the building. We also have, um, well, as part of fire protection systems, we have sprinklers, fire alarm systems, smoke control, but we also have fire resistance and fire separation requirements. And we've talked about those a little bit, um, how those are used to compartmentalize the building. And those are especially important when we're uh, dealing with some of the, the risks that might be associated with dwellings. Um, now, height and area limitations are also part of the equation, part of the tools to manage our fire risks. Structural fire resistance and integrity. Firewalls, for example, are required to uh, withstand a fire on either side and maintain structural stability during a fire. We also have construction types where we limit the materials that are available in certain types of buildings. Mechanical systems are required to shut down or be controlled. Uh, in the case of a smoke control system, the mechanical system could be used along with um, other fans to control the movement of smoke. And then electrically, we have requirements for emergency standby power, emergency lighting and exit signage. So these are some of the tools that we use in the building codes to manage fire risk. So it's very important if these are intended to be there that they actually are there. Now when we talk about means of egress, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but here's 
kind of the concept of means of egress. So we have three components to a means of egress system, and all of this is defined in chapter two and laid out in chapter 10, but we have exit access, exit uh, exits themselves, and then exit discharge. These are the three different components of the means of egress system. Now, determining safety through the code, kind of putting it all together, we need to know how is the building being used, and this is kind of the occupancy classification. We need to know how is the building constructed. This is type of construction and fire resistance. How big is the building? This is all outlined in Chapter 5, height and area limitations, unlimited area buildings, for example. What fire protection features are in the building, whether it has sprinklers, whether it has fire alarm, how is the means of egress system arranged? All of these things are outlined in the building code and behind the scenes we've um, we've shared with you that these are tools that are used to manage, um, manage the risk of the fire hazard. Now we also lay out an entire process for using our building codes. This involves, um, most of this is outlined in chapter one, and this involves a whole team of professionals. From the beginning, we have the designers working with the owners to create the program for the building. Once they have the building um, designed, then they submit it to the building department for review. The building uh, department reviews the plans and then construction can begin. And while construction is ongoing, inspectors are going out there verifying that the plans have been met. And then after the fact, after the CFO has been issued, we have to maintain that building to make sure that it stays uh, as it was originally designed and in accordance with the fire safety plan, all of those systems are still in place. So this is a whole process that involves teams and teams of people from the building owner, the building designer, the building department, the fire department, um, and they overlap quite a bit. So we have to have a coordinated effort here um, between everybody involved in building fire safety. I'm going to end here with a few quotes that I thought were really great. Um, fire safety is a responsibility shared by the public and the private sectors. Because the fire department cannot prevent all fire losses, formal obligations to have built in fire protection fall on owners of certain types of buildings. For the same reason, private citizens have an obligation to exercise prudence with regard to fire in their daily lives. But prudence also requires education in fire safety and the obligation to provide that education appropriately falls in the public sector, chiefly the fire department. The public sector, meaning the building code and fire code enforcement departments also have the obligation to see that requirements for built in protection in the private sector are being met. It kind of puts it all together, right? That this is this is a team effort and we all have to work together. Also keeping in mind that these codes are minimum codes and that uh, a particular owner may realize that they need to beef up um, and offset some of the um, some of the risks that are present in their building. It's not they can't just always rely just on the minimum building codes. Active cooperation is required of the architect and builder on behalf of their clients with building departments and fire prevention bureaus, insurance rating organizations, insurance company fire protection engineers, all of whom have access to life of loss, loss of life records, nationally recognized standards of fire prevention and fire protection, and can contribute to the future life safety of the clients, the guests and employees in both new and existing buildings. I thought that this was appropriate to um, include because this was from the quarterly of the National Fire Protection Association, January 1947 um, issue. 
Now, this is the predecessor, I'm guessing, of the current NFPA Fire Journal. And this was a story about the Hotel Weinkauf disaster that I had brought to your attention at the beginning of this presentation. It kind of brings it full circle and emphasizes and stresses the importance of our teams all working together uh, for the common goal of fire safety. And we'll close again with the station nightclub fire. And that's all I have for you. If you have any questions, feel free to call us um, or email us or chat with us. We are here to help you. Thanks for your attention. Are you there, Meg? I am here. Thank you, Debbie. That was a great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot from you and I appreciate all the time and effort you put into creating this uh, presentation for us all. If uh, you don't have anything additional, we're going to go ahead and close out this live event and uh, we'll be in office hours, let's say four o'clock to 430 today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. Well done. Thank you. See you later.